I had surgery in, in college, playing at the University of Toledo, playing baseball. I hurt my shoulder and um, was prescribed Percocets. I had never felt anything like that before, and it, and it basically gave me the best feeling that I, I thought that I had ever felt. And I, I started abusing them, and the pills got very, very expensive and very addictive. And like we hear just too often today, that people switch from pills to, to heroin. And that's what I did, and I, and I didn't care. I just wanted to feel better, because I was so sick from not having pills. And it was the worst decision that I ever made in my life. Uh, for nine years, I was addicted to heroin, on and off. And in the nine years, I um, hurt a lot of people. Um, I got used to hurting myself, so that wasn't, uh, that wasn't my bottom for me. Getting arrested 13 times wasn't enough for me. Uh, felonies wasn't enough for me. Overdosing wasn't enough. 28 rehabs wasn't enough. I was homeless for about nine months in East Toledo. I would sleep wherever I could in abandoned buildings. I got to a point, I remember calling my mom and asking her if I, uh, I could come inside her garage because it was a blizzard. And she said, Matt, if you step on my property, I'm calling the police. My mom, who I'm very close with, wanted nothing to do with me because of how badly I have hurt her over the nine years. And, I, and I'm not that kind of person. I had no intention of, of hurting her. I just didn't know how to stop. I didn't think that I could get clean and I had so much wreckage that I had accumulated, I didn't think that it was even possible to begin to start working on it. So I wanted to die. And I stole a gun from somebody that I was using with, and I snuck into my mom's garage while she was at work, and I put it in my mouth. I, I, I used the last of the drugs that I had. And... The only reason I didn't pull the trigger is because I didn't want her to come home and find me like that. It's not because I wanted to live, or it's not because I thought that I could stop using. I just didn't want her to find me like that. And um, I called the police on myself. And I had a ton of things against me at the time to where when the police showed up, I thought for sure that they were going to put me in prison for a very, very long time. And they should have, and they could have. Um, but the officer that showed up had some empathy for the situation, and he decided to, to give me another try. He took me to rehab instead of taking me to jail. And I was just like, something. Somebody, something greater than me wants me to be not in prison. I have a purpose in life, and it's not to be in prison. It's not to be out here sticking needles in my arm and, and, and hurting my family. While we were in detox, we would go to like group counseling sessions. And nobody wanted to go again because we were all sick, and, and we would just like pull each other out of our rooms. And before we went into the groups, we would literally put our hands in a huddle like a sports team. And obviously, we were in a recovery center, so we'd just say, one, two, three, team recovery. It was a joke at first. Like, it was really a joke. We had no idea what we were doing. We just knew that we didn't want to use, and we wanted to stay one more day, one day at a time. When we got out and went to the, the treatment center together in the recovery house, we, the team recovery sounded like a good name. It seemed to fit, and we were a team, and, and we were about recovery. I went to my first AA meeting after I left detox, and I met my sponsor, who's still my sponsor today. He started working the steps with me, and I got to step two, which is came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And honestly, at this point in my life, I was, again, I was raised, I, I believe in Jesus, I believe in God. Um, I just didn't know. I, I just kind of felt like if there is a God, why would he have let me do this to my life? And why would he have let me do this to my family? And like, is it is it real? Is he real, you know? And uh, he asked me a question and he just blew me back. He opened the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and he went to uh, the back, the last page of We Agnostics. And he pointed out a line that said, who are you to say there is no God? And I was just like, I don't have an answer for that. And he said, Matt, all I need is a little bit of faith from you. If you just, you don't need to know who your God is or, or how he works in your life, but as long as you realize that it's not you, and that there is a power greater than you that's out there, and you're willing to turn your will and your life over to him, things are gonna get better day by day. I just made a decision to do that, and everything that I was doing in my addiction was selfish, self-centered, self-seeking, and again, I was living it, my life based on, on, on Matt's will rather than God's will. And again, I don't know what God's will is for me. I don't know what the future brings. I don't know where I'm going to be in a year. I just know what his will for me is not. And I know it's not to be um, living in sin and, and, and hurting people and hurting myself every single day. People are so ashamed to say either I'm an addict or 
maybe my son is an addict or my husband or my wife or is an addict. Obviously, it's not something to be proud of, but if it does happen, you can't let that stigma stop you from asking for help. So our original mission was to go out there and break that stigma. And everybody views a heroin addict standing homeless and panhandling. So we decided to, to get out, out there and show that um, addicts can change their lives around and hold positive signs. And that's what we did. We held signs that said, um, free hugs, heroin's killing our town, honk if you hate heroin. And um, we put it on our Facebook page. I think we had like seven followers at the time. And the next morning we woke up and, and we had like a half a million likes and 200,000 shares. And we were just like getting all these messages about where people can go for help. And we were like, okay, this isn't a joke anymore. We need to, we need to like step up our game because this could be something. This could be something big. It's something that, you know, two and a half years ago, when I was sleeping under bushes and in abandoned buildings, I never thought that we'd be opening a treatment center to help other people. I never thought that I would even be alive looking forward two and a half years. And here we are today, you know, opening a, a 22 bed detox facility, a 38 bed, bed inpatient facility, um, intensive outpatient. We have doctors, we have nurses, we have primary therapists that have master's level degrees. Um, it's just, it's a true testament that it doesn't matter what you've been through or how many times you've fallen or how bad you've messed up, um, you can change. Last year in Ohio, we had 4,149 drug overdose deaths. We led the nation. We're the worst state in the country for drug overdose deaths. And I don't, I don't know how much impact we'll have at Midwest or at Team Recovery. I know that we are making an impact, but honestly, if, if I could uh, say that we were a part of lessening that number just by one, then it's a success. You know, I don't want to set huge goals. I don't want to um, figure out exactly where we're gonna be. All I know is I want to make sure that we're doing things right and that our heart is in the right place uh, to help other people. Because again, that's, that's why we started Team Recovery. That's why we started Midwest Recovery Center, is to help. Um, there's a lot of other places that do great things, and I think that if we can just utilize that team aspect of, we can get so much more achieved together than we can alone, uh, we, can, we can really make some things happen in our community, because it needs it, it really needs it.